All right, everybody. We're coming to a close on our demon saga. Man, what a trip. <laughs> uh, we've gone through zombie movies that are not demons. We've gone to haunted churches. We've gone to, uh, I don't know, hippies. I don't know. I don't know why we have demons with all these titles. Uh, even down to the last Fulci flick that we just did. And we're here to talk about the last one in the Demon Saga, which is Delamorte Delamore, a.k.a. Cemetery Man, a.k.a. <laughs> Demons 96. <laughs> 95. Demons 95. That's it. 255. So, yeah. I, and... You know, if you listen to the last episode where I had Court come on, he was like, hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I want to talk about that movie. So we got <laughs> the great, the mighty, the invincible Court Psyops with us today. What's up, man? Uh, I would say that the five or six people that have kicked my ass in my life would probably argue that I'm quite vincible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing excellent, man. Uh, I did not realize Delamorte Delamore was like demons 975 <laughs> to the power of three or whatever. I was going to say welcome to, to Dr. Movie, a.k.a. Demons 12. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just as realistic as any other ones yeah. past two, so... We're uh, recording this before I get a chance to actually listen to the series because I've been listening along. I've worked my way up oh. to uh, the Demons, the Ogre episode, and I'm like, oh, yeah, everything you were feeling about that one. I'm like, yeah, dude, you're not wrong. This is just like <laughs> this is basically the fear of a basement, like extruded for 90 minutes for television. It's not good. <laughs> yep. Let's have it. Let's have a, a swimming pool in here. We'll do a little Inferno underwater scene. We'll do some green slime hanging off the off the ceiling, and there you go, Demons Three. Did you do the De Profundis, which is like technically a Three Mothers trilogy that Luigi Cosi did too? Did you cover that one on this? It's coming. It's yes. coming. Oh. <laughs> Matter okay. of fact, it's it's probably it's what two days ahead of this episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're time traveling back for everybody. Yeah, this series gets really. The, you did Black Demons too. I saw that pop up in my phone. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's well, how that it started. Kind of racist. Yeah. It's how it's how it all started. It started. Sam Edwards reached out to me. He's, hey, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, Demons Three, Black Demons. I thought okay, and I got to look, and I was like, and I th maybe it was Dan Bowen. He's like, how many movies are in that? We were in a conversation. He said, is there like twelve movies? And I go, you know, I I really don't know. So I went back and looked, and I was like, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I know of at least seven, and like four of them are all named Demons 3. Yeah, yeah, three, three. <laughs> there's three Demons 3. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, What a uh, weird freaking way to make a franchise, man. The Italians are nuts. you got to love them, though. Well, it's just that it, it was in name tag only because, you know, again, it's all about just making that cha-ching. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a pot three, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you had Black Demons, you had uh, the Ogre and the Church that are all considered part three. But uh, yeah, I, and and even though we fast forwarded into the future, yeah, man, the uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the third Mother trilogy unofficial uh, third movie is really something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Luigi Cozy sure knows how to make them so that I don't want to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you gotta love him though. You're kind of like, oh, Luigi. You know, <laughs> yeah, his heart's in the right place. He's You're just, right. you know, he just kind of misses the mark here and yeah. there. And again, I'm not. I don't want to bag on him because I do like a lot of his stuff. And sure. he's got he's got the gumption. He's got the can do attitude. And certainly, he's not <laughs> Bruno Mattei, who is a much more egregious filmmaker in Italy than than Luigi Cosi. At least Luigi Cosi doesn't have like a mean spirited vibe True. to everything he does. But True. Mattei totally does. Oh, but we're yeah. not talking about any of that. We're talking about Michael no. Suave. Yeah. Or Suave. Suave, yeah. <laughs> Ikor I... Suave. <laughs> Matter of fact, I mean, as far as his uh, his big hitters, right? I did Stage Fright a little earlier on in this show. Okay. Uh, but the rest of these movies have all fell in this Demons trilogy. you got The Sect, you got yeah. uh, The Church, and you've got this one, which... Is possibly the best movie of all of them. Let's just face it. Even as much as I love demons and stuff, this movie is really something. 
the, the execution and the technical mastery of it, you are absolutely 100% correct. It's mind-blowing. Yeah. yeah. It's it mind-blowing not... that it came out when it did, really. Yeah. yeah, it's not It's not exactly everybody's cup of tea because this is no. certainly the most artistic flair mm-hmm. Calia Suave has done, and it's certainly the most dreamlike and just out there later Argento style of Italian filmmaking as well. But at the same time, it's so technically masterfully done. Yeah. And there's yeah. so many amazing effects. I I feel like this is kind of the pinnacle of his directing career, whether it was 100%. because the, the money dropped out on Italian film shortly after this decade or right at this point in the decade. You know, it was really hard for anybody to get money and things like that. But yeah. I don't know if that's the if that's what the, the cause of it was or if he just kind of, I'm done. This was it. This is all I needed to do. My understanding is he had a child that got real sick and he just kind of put directing aside, put movie making everything aside to, you know, cater to, to that situation at home. And he came back a little later on, later in life, uh, yeah. did more TV, stuff like that. But he hasn't reached anything like this level. Uh, there was even a promised uh, sequel to this that never came about that he was trying to get pushed through. And uh, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe one day he'll he'll decide to do it. But. Yeah, well, if you don't a, know, I, I think he's a fan of the source material. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And and it's like okay, so there's Dylan Dog, which was a very famous comic book, but the yep. first uh, crack at Dylan Dog that the same author that was pretty famous did was this uh, novel or novella or whatever you want to call it that was called Della Morte Della More. Right. So everybody thinks that this is like a loose remake of Dylan Dog because of the similarities, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is. This is a this is basically an interpretation of the novel that was the first stab at doing Dylan Dog. Right. And which what's is fun- why it's so similar, you know? And what's funny is when he when he was creating Dylan Dog in, in the artwork, he based the character off of Rupert Everett. That's the, the, the person that he wanted to be that Dylan Dog character in the in the comic. And ironically, when they made this movie, he played the role <laughs> in this one. Of Della Morte, Della Morte, of Della Morte yeah. yeah. So it's kind of a weird turnaround on all that too. So there's a there's a very interesting history of this movie because it's a weird Italian English German is it German French yeah, yeah French. it's a it's a co production of some sort yeah that's for sure. it's, yeah it's, and, and you can tell because it's got it's got this flair to it but that's that's suave in this I mean again. The cinematography, the way things are shot is just, there is scenes in here that, and I hate to knock on it in a way, I hate to compare it is what I'm trying to get to, Mm -hmm. because there are scenes that I'm saying, I know where that idea came from. I know where that idea came from. This guy, Suave, is an understudy of Argento and all the greats. I mean, he grew up around Fulci, all these guys, and he's taken that and putting it all together and, and started making these films, and you just see it progress so rapidly. I mean... Even stage fright is pretty amazing for somebody that's just coming along and starting to make these flicks. And then you just see this change in just a matter of, what is it, even 10 years from that to this? And it's just like, wow, this this movie is just on a whole different level. And it's not just a straight horror flick. So I know a lot of people that are just absolutely nuts about this movie. I'm and there's, <laughs> yeah, and, and, well, there's, there's every right for it, right? Because yeah. it is it is so unique. It's uh, you almost think uh, that it would it would sit right alongside. I don't know. What am I thinking here? Uh, oh, I think the same kind of folks that get into like Twin Peaks and that surrealist David Lynch feel could probably really dig this if they also liked horror a little bit. Yeah, I, I think you back it up a little bit and go more towards uh, oh, bad taste. Um, <laughs> Meet the Feebles. Oh, okay. So like Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. I couldn't think of, of his a, name. Yeah, a little bit it, of a, a it's got dreamy this, twist. Yeah. Well, it's got a dark. It's got that dark humor to it, right? I mean, this is this has got a lot of comedy in it. It's just morbid. <laughs> you yeah. know. I would say Dead Alive. The Peter Jackson Dead that, yeah. Alive era is yeah. perfect for for that. Yes. Yeah, I can see where you're talking about there. Yeah, but there's but it doesn't look dream. anything like that though. It looks more like. <laughs> Well, I don't know what it looks like. It, it's, it looks it's like a labyrinth. It's filmed like the movie Labyrinth, for right. God's sakes. Right. There you go. <laughs> so that that's what we're saying. That's why it's so hard to describe it, because this really, it really is its own thing. 
Yeah, uh, it's it's another one of those fairy tale things. I mean, this was the era that Italian filmmaking was totally doing, where they had that aesthetic of a fairy tale, just like when we covered Phenomena. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so, if you don't know this movie, Delamota de la Moore, also known, aka Cemetery Man, aka Demons '95, even though it came out in '94, but it didn't come out in the U.S. till '96. Why is it Demons '95? Why is it Demons? Period. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but again, it's because he was tied into all these other movies that they put in this category. And hey, it, the, the demon's name sells, right? So it's the reason that uh, Coca-Cola put Santa Claus, you know, on their advertisements or polar bears or whatever, right? It sells. Um, <laughs> 1994 officially, it says, it says it's a horror slash zombie flick. <laughs> Are zombie yeah. flicks not horror? What? <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, got a little synopsis here. Uh, again, we said uh, uh, Michael Suave, Michael Suave directed it. Marchetti was the cinematographer, which makes a lot of sense. Yep. You got Stivaletti did all the effects. And man, for the time, well, I'd say even for now, these zombies, these creatures have a totally unique look to them. I almost feel like if... Uh, Tim Burton was going to do a zombie flick. <laughs> they might look something like this. Yeah, I could totally see that. Um, Civil Eddie does a lot of really great gore practical yeah. effects in this as well. Yeah. But they have this very surrealistic, almost over the top, like like the later Japanese gore films that came out in the early right. 20 aughts that was specifically for American audiences. This is very much a precursor to that where the gore becomes so over the top it's actually kind of funny and parody right. and it's nowhere near as gross as it could have been and the zombies in this too they're all coming back within seven days of being buried but they have like almost like roots and stuff that are growing out of them you know so it's just a it's just a strange unique idea that's what i love about it because it doesn't look or feel or taste really like any other movie you can say well it's kind of like this kind of like that but i don't know it's really its own thing man how are you Let's, tasting movies? That's what I want to know. Hey, you know, they got to pass the, the smell and taste test, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. So synopsis, something is causing the dead to rise in, in their graves as flesh eating zombies and cemetery custodian or engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Francesco de la Morte grows tired of killing them for a second time. However, the town's politicians won't seem to listen to him. So Francesco is on his own. One day he falls for a beautiful woman whose husband has recently died, but their affair is tragically interrupted by zombies, sending Francisco into a tailspin of madness and woe. That's a good synopsis. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's about right, and it doesn't get too awfully spoiler spoilery to do it. Well, I mean, it, it, the the story is very simplistic. It's just kind of drawn out. But uh, <laughs> let's Fair. let's let's hit our cast for a second, right? Rupert Everett, right? Playing our main character, Francesco De La Morte. Uh, my wife loves this guy, right? Because he ended up being in, I don't know, one of her movies that she likes so much. What is it? Uh, she's He's in uh, My Best Friend's Wedding. But she likes uh, Important of Earnest. That's what it is. Oh, the importance of being earnest, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So when I brought this movie up, I actually rented this from Netflix back in the DVD days, right? I had it delivered oh, wow. to my house in the mailbox. <laughs> and uh can't get that anymore <laughs> yeah who knows maybe somebody will bring it back we're all into nostalgia now right but uh, so yeah i mean when i brought this up she's like what's he doing in this kind of movie i was like i don't know I, I think this is kind of where he started i think it was kind of an early on move he was doing tv stuff and i mean come on you talking about cool as a cucumber man i mean i love the fact that as crazy as this situation is in this movie for him he shows no emotion. He's just even Steven, man. <laughs> no comment? <laughs> well, I was just kind of letting you go for the, the stuff because I'm tired of interrupting you. I feel like I'm being rude no. because I want to jump in on the conversation. That's what so you're just, here for. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for an opening. But I, I think the reason that he's so affected by this, and I think what they're kind of getting at in the movie anyway is that he's got this complete lost sense of what is real and what is not real. Sure. 
So his sense of alarm or danger for any of this stuff only really ever happens when somebody else is in danger and usually if his penis is inside of them at the time. <laughs> Speaking of which. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Fauci, everyone. Uh, oh, man. I mean, come on. She's in this movie for one reason, one reason only, her acting. And uh... <laughs> Yes. It has nothing to do with the fact that she is absolutely gorgeous and oh, stunning. Oh, my gosh. And just completely takes your breath away every time she's on screen. It's 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 incredible. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, is there anybody any more gorgeous? I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. Yeah, I I couldn't tell you. <laughs> so yeah, and and that's the whole point, right? Because here's a guy whose life is like you said, it is so dull and so dead that. There is no surprise. There is no life. And she comes along, who is widowing her dead husband. And he instantly is like, when will I see her again? Right? Even though she's there at a funeral procession. <laughs> Which is, again, the humor in this, man. That he's, he's hitting on her graveside of her dead husband. <laughs> I mean, like, I get it. But at the same time, dude, show some fucking respect, right? <laughs> Oh, man. And, of course, he's throwing all these things at her, too. Like, hey, I've, I've got this awesome room, you know. Uh, nice little pad up here. You know, it's just <laughs> me and Nog, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Nog has to live in the basement like a weirdo. Oh, yeah. Who is, uh, I, there's no way I can say his name. Uh, Francois Haji Haji Lazaro? I know uh, he's French. I know he's a French musician. Okay, yeah, I, I'll i take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was, he's been in a couple of things, but he's mainly known as a musician more than anything else, and a music producer, actually. And uh, he's basically uh, the, the, the grave digger. He, he, you know, really can't do any other work. He has no social skills because he really can't talk. All he answers is, yeah and nah. That's it. He never says a different word. And it's you've almost got this lassie relationship where he'll say, nah, <laughs> and Francisco knows that there's more to it, right? He can like, it's like being able to, you know, Lassie goes, Roo, what is it, girl? Roo, Timmy's down at the barn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the same kind of scenario where he'll just go, nah, oh, stop being foolish. Jump back in the car, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great setup. I mean, it starts off, Francisco's on the phone with his best friend. And he hears a knock at the door and opens up and it's a zombie and he just pulls out a gun and shoots him. And I love throughout the entire movie, the gunshot is like the old spaghetti Western pistol shot. <laughs> you know, there's no doubt that he pulled that from some old sound effects thing. And it's, it's specifically an older style sound. It is not a 90 sound. And it just, and it's the same sound every time he shoots the gun, you know? <laughs> yeah, so they I, totally did that shit on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Well, every, every, I think everything in this is very purposeful. And, again, it just shows the amount of detail that goes into this. Uh, but, yeah, our main character is interested in this lady. She comes back the second day, and you get all these symbolisms of already, even with her just being there. You get this symbolism, symbolism of her being death because every time he, he catches flashes of her you may not really see her, but she'll be wearing this veil and that veil will be flowing in the wind and it's black, right? Very re reaperish, you know? So he's kind of seeing this every time he sees her and he's so attracted to her. So it's like that thing is, is he really attracted to death? Is that what she really is? Which she's referred to as court. She, I she <laughs> she's just she she don't yeah. have a name Ever. right each time every yeah. time she reincarnates i don't yeah. even think it's the same woman i think he just sees a woman he gets fixated on like in Could some be. kind of like endless pattern on the way that his lost reality is that's the thing is you could yep. interpret it however you want we're only yep. seeing things from the eyes of an extremely unreliable narrator <laughs> right right and it's all you know inner voice narration which again just makes it kind of cool and again, just his tone, and he does not get rattled over anything. Uh, people are dying, 
you know, you got investigators showing up, blaming him for murders that happened in the town. And he even gets to the point to where he's fed up with life. He's fed up with love. Every time he tries to get in this situation with she, yeah. like like you said, could be a different person every time, but he sees her. Uh, it always leads to, you know, I'll love you till I die or even after death. Nothing, nothing can separate us. Well, he ends up with her, and apparently the, the word around town is Francisco is impotent. So, I mean, he goes to have a meeting with the mayor, and he's walking through some guys on motorcycles, and they are referring to this guy's impotence. Because, <laughs> you know, Italy, that's just how they roll. <laughs> well, it's also an extremely small town that no one ever gets to escape from for one reason or another. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, this again, there, there's so much to this that I probably even missed. And that's the beautiful thing about this movie, too, is it is, just like Court said, it is totally open to, to your imagination of what you think's happening, what's not. What's your spin on this, man? Okay, so everybody get ready to... Uh go down this path with me because I've, <laughs> I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, maybe on some illicit substances that are still leaving traces behind in my hair from my, my youth. <laughs> Ricky's in rock and roll. He knows what I'm referring to. Blue sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. Only, only, only like, you know, well, I already lost my hair, so let's not worry about that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right. So there's a big set of themes in this. And it all means that in some way, shape, or form, Delamore Day was ineffectual. He was unable to reproduce because uh, they found him to, uh, everybody thought that he was incapable of maintaining an erection, that he was, you know, that, like, basically it's ineffectual or his inability to affect the world in which he lives. And he's so detached from that world and his view of the world is so warped and the reality that he thinks is there isn't necessarily what's going on they even do a bit of a twist at the end of it as well where we're outside of his head for once and yep. he's actually saying nagi instead of nagi and nagi actually talks right after this car crash when he realizes he can't escape the world that he's in uh his ineffectual nature his inability to do anything to alter his environment and the fact that everything gets taken from him including when he starts trying to commit crimes to at least have any kind of an effect on his reality and his world, I feel like, and especially because of the way that death talks to him at the very end there, where he's like, mm -hmm. you can't even tell the difference between the living and the dead. I right. feel like he is either dead, and this is his purgatory afterlife that he's trapped in, where he is literally completely ineffectual. It's like an or a narcissist's hell, essentially, right. because yeah. they're the most self-centered, self-important person in the world to them, and to have everyone else just constantly ignore him and make him be ineffectual and putting him down has to be like a narcissist's hell that he's trapped in. And even yeah. when they pull out, they have him in a snow globe like from uh, Krampus. Mm -hmm. So apparently this took place over Christmas and uh, maybe Krampus <laughs> came to punish him and that's how he's trapped in the snow globe. No, I'm just kidding about that part. But I feel like this is basically his afterlife. And the reason that no one ever escapes when they die in this afterlife and they come back is these like zombie creatures that he then has to put back in the ground and the main reason he's obsessed with the phone book is he's trying to keep track <laughs> right. of the people that are dying and living if they exist if they're not he can't even tell if he himself is dead or alive or what's going on and because he's so ineffectual and he has no place in the world at the very end he just drops out and becomes like he thought nagi was all along and mm -hmm. maybe that's been him this entire time and that's why everybody always plays him off as ineffectual yeah and, and you know, not to give too much away, but yeah, at the end, you've got this big change, right? He's he's driving through this tunnel, and he tells Nagi, who's who's asleep over here, he's like, other side of this tunnel is the rest of the world. And when he gets on the other side, the road is gone. It just stops. And, you know, you have the accident there where Nagi gets hurt, and he's bleeding, and, and you get the situation where... You know, Francisco's got his gun out because he's thinking he's dead and he's going to come back and I'm going to have to shoot my best friend. And But when he wakes up, he's not dead. And then all of a sudden he says something like, I'm tired and I want, can you drive me home? Yeah, it's, so I'm now tired, he's, take me home, yeah. Right, and, and that's, you know, Nagi is now speaking 
like Francisco, Francisco says, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, Nagi, like he, like Nagi always yeah. said, yeah. Yeah, so it's like you had that switch there. Well, and there's also, I mean, death is a huge bit of symbolism, but yeah. the way that they try to escape the town that they're in is to go through a long, dark tunnel mm -hmm. until they see a light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Like going into death, and as he finds, death is no escape from wherever he is. Right. Even if he is actually dead, there's no escape from where they are. Um, there's no difference between life and death where they are. Right. That's, I think that's what the symbolism there is at the end. They're just kind of trapped in this loop of existence. And you get back to more of the nuts and bolts of the story, too, because the relationship with she, the first time, she gets really turned on basically in this room that they're just keeping all the bones and stuff in right an ostrich is what they Aust yeah, to. An, yeah an ostrich ostrich and and yeah. uh but they end up outside on the grave of her husband who just been recently buried <laughs> after she makes him kiss her through a death shroud that she wraps around his face exactly. that she picked up off of a corpse right and yeah. that's again uh, so much symbolism of reading into this whole death thing, you know. And uh, <laughs> I mean, like I can see what he sees in her. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, and I kept thinking to myself, you know, if there was a little town where there was four or five girls running around, they were all this girl. I probably need to move there. <laughs> you take your chances, right? Um, <laughs> One out of four isn't bad, you know. You got to give it a shot. See now, what don't be sad, cause one, cause out, one of out of four ain't bad. bad. That's for all you meatloaf fans out there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we always um, sing when we get together. It just always happens. It's magical. <laughs> <laughs> Never yeah. thought I'd be harmonizing meatloaf on a <laughs> podcast about Delamorte Delamore, but here I am. Another one off the bucket list. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so, and again, this whole rumor about him not being able to, you know, do the deed. Conjugate uh, the verb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not a problem, right? Because she is, she is it. She is it. And uh, ironically, while they're, you know, whistling Dixie, <laughs> uh, you know, her dead husband pops up out of the ground, right? And, uh, she gets attacked, gets bit, and collapses. And then, of course, they have to take care of the zombie and kill him. And then he takes her inside, lays her down. She's not responding, calls the doctors. Doctors come in. She died from fright, you know, or a heart attack or, you know, something to that degree, right? And uh, so they've, they've got her, you know, laid out. And of course, he's afraid to bury her because she's going to come back. Why rest? Why waste the time burying her, and then coming back and then have to kill her, and then bury her again? That's double double handling. Something I teach at work. That's not something we do. Only <laughs> only dig the hole once, right? <laughs> and, uh, she just she comes back, right? And he has the pistol ready, and he shoots her again, right? So now she's dead. Buries her. Then later on in the movie, as this goes on, this is where you get a situation where uh, Nagi, like I said, the, you had uh, Francisco and Nagi go to town, have a meeting with the mayor. The mayor is just talking about all the crazy stuff that's going on. And somehow he's he's up for re-election, and his teenage daughter is there, uh, Valentina. And uh, she's looking at Nagi, and Nagi is just, out of his mind over this girl, right? He's looking at her. He's getting all nervous. She's like, "Oh, he's so cute, you know. What is <laughs> what is he doing? Is he dancing?" He's like, <laughs> and Francis is like, "Nope, he's gonna." Yep, he threw up on her. And <laughs> he's like, "You might want to back up." And then he tells the, <laughs> tells the mayor, "You might want your daughter to back up." And again, he's ineffectual. No one can stop him. It's like he's not there. It's almost right. like he's just haunting everybody. Yep. Essentially, and then boom, Nagi just vomits all over. Her. Yep. And the thing is, is it's not like a, I need to go get myself clean up. She falls on the ground. She stands up and this guy on a motorcycle, Claudio shows up and she just jumps on the back of the bike with Claudio and they ride off. <laughs> she also doesn't even make a big deal about it. She's like, Oh my no. God, he was so nervous. He, was he threw so, up on me. Yeah. It's adorable. It's, it's adorable. He was cute. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and she's smearing that vomit all over the jacket of the boyfriend that just picked her up. Yep. Yeah. And Claudio's like Mr. Cool, right? I mean, all, all the chicks dig him. He's the leader of this little motorcycle group. 
So you get this very, like you said, very small community, and all these characters, they just kind of rotate around the whole story. You just keep seeing them kind of appear back up. Well, Francesco and, and Nagi go back home. In the process of them going home and dealing with stuff there, Claudio and his motorcycle group go uh, have a head-on collision with, with a bus, boy, bus full of Boy Scouts. <laughs> And you get this, you know, blood splatter on the front of the, the bus. The bus obviously runs over the people on the motorcycles. Then it kind of runs off. I don't know if it's a ditch or what, but the bus ends up having a wreck and it kills Every how many Boy Scout. How yeah. many Boy Scouts? It's a bunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. They don't have enough shells for this. <laughs> yeah. So now you get this big procession going on where there's, <laughs> I mean, as far as you can see, there's these caskets and what are they saying? Singing, uh, don't want to go to the Boy, uh, Boy Scout picnic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what it is, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's strange and surreal. Yeah, so you get this big burial of all these people, and of course the mayor's there, and he's upset. His daughter is dead, and they he put her in a glass case, right? And you can see the scar across her face where they had to do you know work to fix her back up so she looks decent enough to display her. I'm pretty sure there was a shot in there where you see her head get split open, too, a little bit. Maybe um, so. It's, it's like real quick in the accident, but... Yeah. Yeah, the stitching work that they do on the actress's <laughs> face while she's laying in that glass coffin is cool too. Yeah, yeah. it looks really good. Yeah, so I mean, it's it, it's just got this has got so much stuff in it. Uh, later on, uh, you get a scene where she comes back again, right? And you're going, wait a minute. Now, when she comes back, she's like obviously a zombie. She's got roots and stuff growing out of her hair and all this stuff. She's got, I don't even know how to describe it. It's almost like rolls of toilet paper <laughs> okay, that are so, flying behind her. It's Yeah, they buried her in like a communion dress is what it kind of right. looked like. And I think it's like a veil for her communion dress or something similar to that, which is very clearly her father's choice because he infantilizes his daughter quite a bit in this. Yeah. Um, and so Nagi digs her up and he just like her head had to be apparently stitched back on as well because there's all of a sudden this giant scar across her throat whenever yep. he breaks the coffin and he's trying to lift her up out of the coffin by her head and then her head just pops off. And then for some reason that makes absolutely no sense other than the fact that she decides, you know what, you're cute and uh, I don't have a lot going for me now that I'm just a reanimated head. That would be right. a clip on my show. Uh, <laughs> she decides that, you know, she's going to kind of give him a chance. So she gives him a kiss and then all of a sudden she can just start floating and she floats around yeah. behind him and, now she's just hanging out with him and the busted TV that Della Morte <laughs> shot up trying to deal with all the freaking uh, Boy Scouts. Boy Scout that, zombies. <laughs> yeah, like when he accidentally shot Nagi's TV. Like now the girl's has severed reanimated head just lives in there and sings to him and entertains him. And <laughs> they're just happy with their weird like reanimated necrophilic TV set having love. Yeah. I don't know why I, people have a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, let them be happy. <laughs> And then the Francesco story, his woman comes back. She, who's been buried out there, she comes back. And, of course, she's obviously a zombie, but a very sultry zombie. <laughs> she is the sexiest root-covered corpse I have ever yeah. seen. Yeah. Even for me, that's saying a lot. And of course they backlit and she's floating and she's coming towards him and you got all this stuff and he starts putting it together in his head. Uh oh. Yeah, she, she didn't die from the zombie bite. Right, which is pretty much canon in any zombie flick, right? If you get bit or scratched, zombie demons, whichever you want to pick, uh, you become that, right? So or a nasty freaking viral infection at the very right. least of some sort that'll wreck your right. life, yeah. And uh, he starts thinking, wait a minute, she didn't die from the bite. She wasn't even dead the first time. She was just out. <laughs> now, why the doctors weren't good enough to know that, you know, because I guess with her laying there naked, it's hard to see. <laughs> it's hard to keep your focus on, is she breathing or not? <laughs> just saying. Surely you could check for a pulse while staring at her tits at the same time. You would I mean, think. Come on. You would think. But you would... If I was the doctor, <laughs> if I was the doctor, maybe not. I'm just saying. Um, but anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. So he puts it together that 
the zombie bite does not turn you into a zombie. So that's something a little different too that's that's in this playbook. Um, because that plays into something later on too where Nagi tries to kill Francisco because guess what? She bites him and you know Nagi automatically thinks, well, he got bit, he's going to be one, I'm going I'm to have to kill him. And he's like, wait a minute, it's not how it works. So... Lucky it's, for him, he figured it out for her, you know, that it happened from her just in time to save his life and continue on. Right, right. <laughs> and But again, is that his luck? I mean, because as this goes on, he don't really want to live. He's he's wanting to end something here, right? Because it gets to the point to where um, you brought up the phone books, which I think is another cool thing, right? He's He's keeping up in the phone books. Who's been? Who's dying? Who he's buried? And this is his form of entertainment. And there's a scene where they're burning trash and stuff. <laughs> Nagi rolls out a wheelbarrow and dumps it, and it's got the phone books in it, which is being laid right onto a fire. He's like, "What are you doing? This this was my read, <laughs> you know?" Yeah, he was like, "These are classics. Just because they're expired doesn't mean that they're not good." <laughs> and then out of that, you get the ashes that are coming up from the book, and they start floating up. You got these black pieces of ash like floating in the air. And they all come together, and it becomes this incredible Grim Reaper puppet, which is oh, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really, really amazing. Cool. Yeah, possibly the best I've ever seen. Oh wow! Yeah, it's really damn good. It's hard to it's hard to yeah. beat that Reaper. I mean, you you know it's you know it's a puppet, but it doesn't really move like a puppet. So <laughs> this is the labyrinth thing I was referring to. Yeah, right. The puppetry things in this like that. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's, and of course he, he makes up a point of quit killing the dead, start killing the living, you know? Yeah. If you're tired of killing the dead, just start killing the living. And basically he wants them to be shot in the head before they get buried. So they can't come back. There you go. So it's got all these twists and the way that this is put together, there, there's a scene where, um, well, here we go. <laughs> the next part the the mayor comes back and sees his dead daughter's head in the tv the head's well, talking yeah he wants to dig his daughter up for a campaign for a, for a, photo yeah for a photo shot i yeah. mean <laughs> and then obviously he gets upset when her head is missing and the coffin's been smashed in and della morte being della morte is just like yeah whatever i guess that's a thing that happened but clearly i didn't do it yeah i didn't do it so and uh <laughs> but he hears her calling yeah, she and calls he, out to him. Yeah. yeah, and he tracks down there, and then she kind of spills the beans of, hey, um, we want to get married. <laughs> Me and Nagi want to get married. These he two takes... crazy kids, one a headless <laughs> corpse, <laughs> the other one a grave digger. <laughs> and, of course, the father, you know, definitely doesn't approve, right? And he's he doesn't even act surprised that the head is talking to him. And, again, that's... <laughs> he's that's not the... upset that she's reanimated. He's upset no. that she wants to marry the grave digger. Yeah. And again, it just shows you kind of the just off kilter feel that this movie's got. Again, it's the it's the the, the dark humor here. Oh yeah, this movie's so weird, dude. <laughs> well, the the mayor gets killed in all this process, right? Yep. And he gets buried. He comes back alive. He's trying to climb over over the security wall <laughs> to Using get an out. Old ladder that's like breaking <laughs> on him and stuff. It's so funny. And and Francisco's coming like, mayor, you can't do this. <laughs> He's like. You you need to be dead. You need to be back here. You got to get back in your hole in the ground. He's like, I'm the mayor. You can't tell me what to do. So he just shoots him in the head. And then he goes, ex mayor, ex mayor. <laughs> like he doesn't even give a shit. He's just so <laughs> nonplussed about having to rebury a corpse. That's the and, biggest thing. That's the biggest takeaway of this movie. He yep. just is tired of having to bury people twice. Is it? Yep. That's it. That's Absolutely. all that this is about. <laughs> and being called engineer. Nobody ever calls him anything but engineer. Yeah. You know, there's this little sweet lady that comes and visits the graves every, like every day. And, uh, <laughs> and is physically more, uh, <laughs> disabled with like, like, she starts with like a cane yep. and then she's like carrying a walker and then she has like an oxygen tank or something. <laughs> yep. I can't remember what it was, but like, she's just clearly deteriorating right before his eyes. And she's even got pictures. Which one of these you think would look better on my tombstone? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. She's visiting her future gravesite. She can't wait to be buried. <laughs> And of course, he goes, what you always say, both of them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So bizarre, man. It's such a bizarre movie. But, but you got a new mayor, and the new mayor shows up, and his assistant is guess who? That's she. right. 
she, Anna Fauci, comes out again. And, of course, instantly, he's attracted to her. Can't say I blame him. Yeah. And we go through that same scenario again when she leaves. He's like, when will I see her again? You know? Well, ironically, she shows up at his place and starts making the moves on him. And they kind of hit it off, and she just says, I feel like I just know you. It's like I should have been here all along. And, you know, I, it's like I love you, and I don't even know you. And all this, you know, you're getting all that, you know, love conquers all kind of thing going on. <laughs> but then she says that uh, she heard that he wasn't able, right? He was impotent. And she said that was a good thing because she was frightened of sex. No, she's terrified of penises. Well, yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, she said she's terrified of erect penises is basically what she says. <laughs> and uh, Can't say I blame know, her. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as, as stupid as men are, what does Francisco do the next day? He decides to get his junk cut off just so he can be with this woman because he's so in love with her. Right. Right. That's love. <laughs> Even, even the fucking doctor's like, are you serious? Right. No, I can't do this to you. No. Yeah. So instead of cutting it off, he pulls out a syringe. I don't know. <laughs> Four foot long. I don't know. <laughs> it's really big. Yeah. The needle's about two and a half yep. feet. It looks like, yeah, it looks like something for like a horse. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Yeah. And he's yeah. like, I'll give you a shot of this and it'll numb things and nothing will work for a month. And, you know, we'll just have to do this every month or whatever. And, and he, you know, uh, Francisco's like laying in the chair and he's got going to flip over to his backside. He's like, no, 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 no. I got to give a shot there. <laughs> And there's quite a bit of liquid and quite a huge needle to have to <laughs> yeah. go through. And it pretty much makes him sick and yep. like unable to move for like a long time to where Nagi's taking care of business after this shot. Like, and the lady doesn't see him the entire time right. while, he's, while he's ill. Like, what is he going through this pain for? Yep. And when she finally does show up, she says, well, basically her boss, the, mayor, the new mayor, yeah. The mayor raped, raped her, her. Right. raped her, and she liked it. <laughs> well, she, she, it, it got her over her fear, and then they decided to try it where he was more gentle, and then she ended up liking that, which is really fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just like, you're, you're just like, dude, you almost had your junk cut off for this girl, yep. and she totally just abandons you right there. What yep. the hell? So you get that situation, and then you get another situation. To drown his sorrows, he goes into town, goes to the bar. He's drinking it up, and uh, he ends up having this hitchhiker come up, or a young lady, and says, hey, can you uh, can you give me and my friend a ride back to our place? And he's like, you know, piss off, whatever, you know, till he sees the friend. Guess who it is? It's That's she. right. Anna it's she again. Herself. And uh, he's like, absolutely, jump in the car. <laughs> After all this, you're still going to get in the car and take her. And guess what? Hey, can you come up for a drink or something? I said, sure. Yeah, why not? So here we go again. He goes in the bedroom with her. Things happen. And, you know, she's, I think he asked, does she, does she love him or something? And she says, yes. She and he, tells him in the car, she can make dreams come true. Right. And he says, will you? Can you fall in love with me or will you fall in love with me or will you love me forever or something? Right. And she says that she's already in love with him and then they bang. And then he right. keeps making her tell him that she loves him <laughs> while they're banging. And at some point he goes to like throw down with her again after she tells him his medication doesn't work. She's like, yeah, come on, this is the third time. Yeah, she's like, you've you've come three times already. And he, he goes, said, I faked the third one. <laughs> yeah, he says twice, I faked the third one. <laughs> And you can tell she's like, no, no, I've had enough. Please just give <laughs> right. me a break. Right. <laughs> so he finally gets up, puts his pants on stuff, goes back in the other room. And the, and the other girl that's there hits him up, says, ah, that's that's a hundred bucks or a hundred, whatever it is, wherever they're at, Leary or whatever. <laughs> yeah. He's like, what? Well, yeah, this is, this is how we pay for our school. You know, we're going to college and we're, you know, we're, we're hooking. That's, that's how this works. She's a, she's a hooker. <laughs> and but she's she, like, she told me she loved me. And she's like, she oh, said, that's 150. That's 150. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, she tasked me to stay the night. He goes, oh, well, that's 200. That's 200. So uh, he has hit a wall, finally. Third time's the charm, I guess. 
he hits this wall, so he goes inside, back to the bedroom. She's kind of asleep, and they got one of those little plug-in heaters, right? <laughs> he takes that heater, puts it up on the bed that she's still asleep in, throws the sheet over the heater, and walks out. <laughs> Yeah, because she keeps talking about how she's cold and come back to bed to warm me and all of that stuff. So he just puts the heater in there, and then he says, you'll never be cold again. And Walks like, out. It, it catches on fire while he's standing there getting Boom. dressed. Yeah. He just lets it be. He just, like, is standing there like it's nothing. And then by the time he gets out to his car, you can hear all of the ladies in the apartment screaming as fire just fills the frame you're like what yep. the fuck <laughs> it's such a left turn from everything else we've seen like all the humor drains from oh, the last man. half of this and it turns into like american psycho yeah and and he <laughs> and he's different at this point too because now he decides maybe he needs some different kind of action he goes into town he shoots some people <laughs> and it's all it, it gets to a point it's kind of like a serial killer right because there's a point where they 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 do want to get caught to some degree right yeah it's kind of the thrill of the chase thing is and he's kind of at that point he kills some people he'll burn these girls up for sure the inspector who's in this movie throughout the whole thing always coming back and talking to him trying to accuse him of stuff at first and he's like well it couldn't have been me because of this 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 well we don't think it's you anyways we think it's nagi you know you get all these kind of scenarios, they and it gets to where he's just blatantly doing stuff, trying to get the, the officer to realize it is him doing it, and the officer still is like, "Nah, it can't be you. You 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 can't do that kind of thing." Well, that comes to the head in the cemetery where absolutely the, the police officer carries the uh, or brings him like the scrap of paper from the check that he wrote the girls before he burned them alive. <laughs> And he said, hey, I'm a man of the world, too. I know why you were there, and I know what this check is. I wanted to give you this back before it ruins your reputation. And he's like, well, isn't that evidence? Don't you need that for their deaths? And he's like, no, the man that already did it confessed. He yep. immediately went home and killed his wife and his child and then killed himself. Or he's in the hospital. He's, you know, almost near death. And, and like, Rupert Everett's character, Delamorte, is like, mad about it. I, I can't even murder people to make a change or bring about right. anyone to notice me in this world. Like he's, he's like really upset that someone quote unquote stole his crimes. This is where it yeah. gets really American psycho. Oh yeah. 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 So he goes to the hospital. I'm, I guess he's planning on killing the person that's claimed the right to his murders because he's pissed off about it and goes there and it's his best friend, which in the opening scene of the movie, he's talking to his buddy on the phone. And they're friends through the whole thing. He's involved in very little. You don't see him much in the movie, just clips here and there. But he's laying in, in the hospital bed. He's close to dying. And he can't believe that his best friend did this. And this whole time he's having this conversation with him, what little he can talk. Because um, he drank a whole bottle of, what did they say, iodine? Iodine, yeah. He took yeah. a whole bottle of iodine, and that's why he's dying. Yeah, and uh, a nurse will come in. What are you doing in here? And he'll just pull out the gun and bam! <laughs> shoot the nurse keep sitting there keep talking to the guy the a nun comes, comes in, yeah. the doctor comes in and uh <laughs> asks why the nurse is laying on the floor and why is she being so lazy checks oh, the stuff oh, and says it was the nun first right because yeah. she goes why is she on the floor oh she's praying yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's like whatever and then so he checks all the he checks all the dials and everything ignores all the blood that's clearly everywhere <laughs> says some kind of weird nebulous thing and then he gets shot in the head and then falls right on top or right next to where the nun is. And then he goes back into the dialogue of like, why did you take my crimes and all of this kind of stuff. Right. And then the nurse comes in and asks what happened. And he said they murdered each other to her. <laughs> and she's like, she's just looking at him like, I know you're lying. He's like, what, you don't believe me? And then he just fucking shoots her. Yep. <laughs> and then she's, she's laying there dead. And then he goes back to interrogating the guy. And he finally gets to the point where the guy is getting worked up again and he goes to answer him. He spits out the tube and he says, who are Goal. you? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't even know who you are like yeah. at all. And that's where you don't even know for sure if any of the people that he's been killing or if any of the zombies that he's been reburying after shooting or any of this is even real. And then he just tells him to go away. Yeah. You <laughs> he know? just asks him to let him die in peace. Go away. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, you know what this movie, I mean, Another movie I think this kind of ties into, or or you can see the similarities, is it's got a bit of Fight Club in it. Know what I mean? 
Yeah, that loss of reality and that. Yeah, it, the, you get the thing. surreal yeah. thing, the dual person. I mean, it, it's I, I never really put that together, but there's something about that that reminds me. Because I was thinking about this scene in the in the hospital, which is weird because you're going into a huge regular hospital where you know they get the gurneys and stuff there that they're rolling across the floor, and it's got the one wheel that's stuck the wrong direction. I mean, it's got all that stuff. But that scene where he's in the room and it backs up, and you get this overhead view. And that room is set up just like the uh, the scene in Suspiria, where all the yeah, girls are in the, the gym. in yeah. the gym. Yeah. So so there, and that's the, that's these things I kind of wanted to point out that caught my eye when I was watching this. When he first sees the girl, uh, when he sees she and she's with the the new mayor, and uh, and maybe it's when she comes back and they do the scene where they're kind of kissing and hugging each other, and the camera is working its way around them, and then they're turning as well. So you kind of get this kind of thing going on, which is just like the scene in Carrie, where William Cat and Carrie are dancing at the prom because you get the camera going around, but they're also dancing around. But then there's a displacement that happens, and he ends up in a in a scene where she's back off and he's up here and he stops. And there's no doubt he pulled that idea from from De Palma. I, I just there's there's no way that didn't happen, and he did because it's almost the exact same formula. Uh, or he went back to Hitchcock and took the same well, kind of shot that well, that's what De Palma yeah. was. De Palma was taken with that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean everybody, everything comes back to Hitchcock one way. That's or another. true. Even you that's go, true. if you go through Argento or De Palma to get there, yep. one way or another, you're coming back to Hitchcock shots for that stuff. There were some some Fulci scenes that you know were very reminiscent of some Fulci shots that were in this. Oh, the that, head explosions when people are getting shot are very much Gates of yep. Hell and City of the Living Dead yep. for sure. Oh, and uh, there's you know when he picks up a. Uh, one of the the iron crosses and stabs one of the the zombies in the head and it's it's stuck that's in the, their head that's the husband that's how he kills the husband whenever, right right after he's right. done fighting the wife which yeah. is just like the pickaxe scene from stage fright oh yeah, yeah you know right. which he also does one with a pitch uh pitch uh pickaxe in this too and it's almost the same thing so he that effect which i think is one of the best pickaxe effects I've ever seen. You kind of see that twice in here. One's with the pickaxe, one's not, but same scenario of, of setup for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, some of these things caught my eye and I was like, okay, I, I know where the, where they pulled that from, you know, that, that same idea. So, uh, again, this is, this is Suave spreading his wings <laughs> literally. And, uh, what an amazing screwed up film. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if this is going to be your swan song for major motion picture filmmaking, yeah. this is a good one to end on. They, they really refer to this movie as the last hurrah for Italian horror of, of the time anyway, because this is, you know, going from the 70s and the 80s, that's that's the Italian benchmark, right? And this is oh, kind of yeah. what they consider to be kind of where it all just really stopped. And all the money dropped out in yes. the late 80s for sure. Yep. And that's why these co-productions had to happen. And you had to be somebody like Suave or yeah. be backed by somebody like Argento to even get something made in the late 80s and early 90s for uh, Italian cinema. So I'm not surprised at all. And the fact that you did get a Dylan Dog movie, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, you, a, and you're almost proto, like, yeah, wow. Proto Dylan Dog, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's original source material. Right. And it's like if 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 we're willing to take the chance on that why couldn't you pick this up and run with it again you know so i don't know of course that really flopped dylan dog did not do well you know at all but uh, still this the interesting concept so uh i don't i don't really know what else to say about this one this is an amazing film it's a cinematic experience that's got very few things that you can relate to other flicks it's really its own thing it's beautiful it's ugly it's well shot it's funny but the zombies look good it's got enough gore for a gore hound uh, it's got a terry gilliam kind of feel with the yes so much more yeah that's actually perfect terry gilliam instead of twin peaks that's the surrealism is terry gilliam. yeah yeah it right there yeah, and that's that's why it's so hard to describe, and you can tell just from listening to the story, the 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 content of what's happening here, this movie is just bonkers. But it's so well done, and at the end of it, you still don't really know what you're watching. You're kind of going, okay, uh, you know, I saw this movie back, I don't know, twenty years ago, and I'm, 
I just watched it again recently and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I just saw. So <laughs> I've loved this film for 23 years. Yeah. Um, I knew about it because I was a Fangoria reader, but I could never mm. find and cemetery man, the original like VHS release over here was heavily cut. Yeah. So I could never really even find that because that was super out of print by the time I was looking for this in like 98, 99, you know, when I, when I was in school in Pittsburgh, I found a bootleg copy of this that was recorded from a Japanese laser disc, laser complete, disc. complete with the Japanese subtitles over top of the film. <laughs> and it was widescreen and it was recorded to a VHS tape mm -hmm. and I bought it at a well, I can't say the name of the store because like it was a bootleg. So, and right. I don't even know if they're open anymore because it's been 20 some odd years, but it was the, everybody that knows me from Pittsburgh knows that it was the music store I always went to to buy my movies. So we'll just like, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, but anyway, it was a total bootleg and I paid like 20 some odd bucks for it. It had Japanese subtitles on it and it was the widescreen mat. So there's black bar at the top and the bottom, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like ultra widescreen. I watched it. Just I bought it on a whim because I wanted to buy a zombie movie, and the guy literally said, "Oh, you should buy this one. You see Anna Fauci's tits constantly." <laughs> and I'm a 20 year old guy, so I'm like, "Sure, why not?" Yeah, you know. And so, and he was like, you know, he told me about Mikel Suavia, and, and you know, because I was an Argento fan and stuff, so mm -hmm. he steered me towards this film, and I I loved it. I absolutely became obsessed with it. And I was in college at the time, so I literally showed it to every single person I possibly could. That's what you do, man. If yep. you were over at my house to get drunk because you could keep a keg in my in my tub and get away with it and not have to worry about getting busted in your dorm because I had an apartment, you were watching Della Morte Della Morte to be able to drink <laughs> at my house. You know what I mean? Like that was what was it was just on the TV, it was on the stereo, and we were just gonna watch this weird fucked up movie. And it was a great party movie. Sure. People were like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, that doesn't matter. Just keep drinking. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think's going on? <laughs> you know? Right. And the more I watched it, the more I absorbed the story that's going on in it. And the more that I just kept going back and rewatching it and rewatching it, the more I loved it. Then I bought it on DVD whenever Anchor Bay released it as Cemetery Man, but it was the full Della Morte Della Morte cut. Hmm. Uh, all the gore, everything included. I had that DVD and... Tonight for the review, uh, right before we even recorded, I have the Shameless Blu-ray. I mm. imported it, and it looks gorgeous. Cool. It looks amazing. I watched it on my projector, and the cinematography was almost overwhelming. Yeah. The the images, like yeah. the frame is so full, and it's so beautiful, and yeah. grotesque, and horrific, and, and just amazing. And it's really well put together, and it's yeah. worth watching yeah. just for... The visuals alone if you yeah. don't even want to pay attention to anything else couldn't agree more uh i forgot to throw another name in there and again i hate i hate comparing but there's definitely some kubrick feeling shots in this too oh yeah and, the expansive stuff the model yes. shots that they put in yes yeah yeah the, and it, just the it, opening shot that starts inside of the skull and then slowly pulls out with those the, that really serious zoomed in camera yeah yeah just that right before they even introduce uh, uh rupert uh yeah. Rupert's character of Della Morte, it's it's that is so Kubrick right there. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to me, as a, if you're a film student, you should check this out just because this is a great example of, like you said, you got the surrealism thing, but the way that this movie is put together is so masterfully done, so beautifully shot, uh, you know, I don't want to go around saying Suave is the greatest director of all time, but man, if this is where he was heading, it's it's a shame that he stopped where he did because who knows what we would have got. Um, yeah. yeah, if he would have been able to continue on this surrealistic, like he comes to America and continues on this surrealistic trip of yeah. filmmaking, yeah. he could have done some amazing stuff. Yeah. He yeah. might have been just the, the the exact right person for the right movie. It's just one of those things where it just seems like everything line, lined up perfect and – you get this master class of filmmaking in this weird little bizarre uh, Italian German French movie. <laughs> Can a lifetime of assistant directing under Dario Argento yep. and second unit directing for several other Italian directors mm -hmm. turn you into an amazing filmmaker? The answer is yes, because look at Della Morte Della Morte. And it's it is. It's a total right. shame yep. he couldn't do more after this. It absolutely is. Yep. But what a swan song to go out on though. It's it's incredible. And even just as a zombie flick, 
it, it's yeah. it's worth having you i know some people that like this this is their favorite zombie movie and i can see why i really can yeah. Uh, because it, it, it gives you a different aspect of what we've been told is canon time and time again. Even if you're just coming into this for the visceral guts, gore, and tits that are in the film. And that's, I mean, when I'm 20, that's the only reason I watch this. I will freely admit it. <laughs> I gave two shits about the art in it as a 20 year old. I had to grow into a person that liked more than just tits and gore. Not much more of a person, but like I, I've, I've, I'm able to appreciate film on a different level now. And I made everybody watch it just because it was gross and there was boobs in it and sex and all sorts of fun stuff. And it's, it's, you know, you can enjoy it on that very visceral, very base, very animalistic level right. that court the bastard did in his twenties, <laughs> or you can enjoy it now that the more refined cultural court, the bastard in his forties can enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, folks. What a way to end this demons saga with the 10th, oh, the 10th movie or the 10th, well, it's the 10th quote unquote. Yeah. Movie. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, quick rating. It's a five out of five. Oh yeah. Hard five mashing yep. the button, trying to get six. Yep. There, there's no way you can't be in awe. Of, you, you may not like this movie, but you can't deny that this thing is, <laughs> is a masterpiece. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, uh, I'm glad everybody took this trip, and I'm glad to have Court come on and talk about this movie because I remember bringing it up. Well, you guys heard it when we did Phenomena. Do, 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 do. <laughs> he even kind of said, hey. You get know, your boy up. <laughs> yeah, let a, let a brother in on that one. So, uh, <laughs> let me get some of that, Delamorte, Delamore. <laughs> let me get some of that. <laughs> and great, I mean, great story, too, because to, to know that it was – hitting you in a time when you were that young and hey if you're coming to my house is what we're watching i was kind of that way with reanimator right yeah that was my y'all gotta see this <laughs> you know <laughs> well, it was like uh uh return of the blind dead oh, uh, yeah. della morte della more um reanimator would have been one of them too that i was showing to like everybody at the time but also uh Dr. Butcher MD, AKA Zombie oh, yeah. Holocaust. Yeah. When it was like when it was like a guy's night to be drinking and there was no ladies around, Zombie Holocaust was on. Yeah. That, man. that was our party movie, like party movie kind of thing to play the, in the twenties. The dude jumping over the stairwell will always be one of my favorite movie <laughs> moments ever. Yeah. And, ever. Uh, you've definitely you've you've done Dr. Butcher MD on my show. Right. So everybody can check that out if they want to hear us talk about yeah. that, like we're just it, doing here. It'll pop up here too, I'm sure. I'm yeah. <laughs> because that I mean uh, I'll save that for the show. We'll, we'll talk about it another time. <laughs> Get uh, your boy up. <laughs> uh, Maybe we I should do a mental rental can... with it someday. That'd be a blast. There you go. There's an option. So, folks, if you're listening to this and you you would like to hear a mental rental. Now, mental rental is a show that Court and, my, and myself do, and we do movie commentaries. And it's for the Patreon for Legion. So if you sign up for that, you have access to all this stuff that, you really can't get anywhere else. And if you're a Patreon listening listener and you would like us to do a commentary for that, let us know. We'll do it. Yeah, hit we your will do it <laughs> all night long. <laughs> you can do it all night long. <laughs> man, it's um, always a blast. I always love getting together with you, man. Always fun. Yeah, absolutely, Ricky. <laughs> I always have so much fun recording with you, man. It's always right. a blast. Thank you so much for having me on to do this movie. No problem, man. I'm, again, I mean, I'm sure this thing will keep going. We'll keep adding on. You'll keep saying, hey, man, let me in there. So <laughs> not a problem, man. Not a problem at all. <laughs> all right, folks, that's going to be it for this episode. We will check you later. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>